As David mentioned, my name is Liam O'Brien uh, from Spruill, and myself and Chris Mildy will be demystifying Canadian price differentials for everyone today. Um, we'll start by describing the factors that went in to these uh, significant crashes at the end of 2018. We'll go into the um, influences that create what we call the kind of fundamental level of differentials or the expected level of differentials. And then we'll talk about um, where we see these differentials moving going forward. Uh, I'll be touching things on the gas or on the crude side, sorry, and Chris will be talking about things on the gas side. So as I said, uh, I've divided this um, presentation into four uh, chunks, the first two crude differentials and crude outlook, and then Chris will be doing the same on the gas side, gas differentials and gas outlook. So in order to set the stage, uh, I wanted to show what happened in 2018, in particular late 2018, that really got industry and media talking about these differentials, uh, Canadian differentials differentials, in particular the WCS and WTI differential. Um, but first let's start uh, at the beginning of 2015 here on the green, or on the yellow line. And what we notice if we move across uh, towards the end of 2017, uh, the differential remains somewhat flat around that $15 US per barrel mark. Um, and then uh, we see obviously what got everybody talking uh, towards the end of last year, differentials fell out or widened significantly. Um, so I'll be talking about what we think goes into this number here uh, in terms of a breakdown of a few different factors, the, the normalized $15 US per barrel differential. And then we'll be talking about uh, the factors that affected uh, or created this increase in differentials at the end of 2018 and then where we see these factors going forward. So what creates price differentials for Canadian crude? Uh, this is a pretty simple formula uh, that we'll be breaking down over the next little bit. Uh, the price of a barrel of Canadian crude equals WTI crude in most cases minus a quality adjustment, a transportation adjustment, and then depending on the factors, plus or minus any market factors going on. Um, so to explain these price differentials, we have to explore a little bit of economic theory. Uh, the price of a good is underpinned by, we, by what economists call the law of one price, um, which tells us that in the absence of trade frictions, two goods, two identical goods, must sell at the same price regardless of location. Now, um, the important part in that statement, two things, uh, identical goods, and the absence of trade frictions. So if we apply this concept to Canadian crude in the context of the North American crude marketplace, uh, we have to ask ourselves a few key questions. Number one, is the crude marker that we're comparing our crude to, in almost all cases we compare to WTI, is it physically identical to a barrel of WTI? Um, the second question we have to ask ourselves is, do we sell all our crude here in, in Alberta or do we have to transport it to the same market that sells WTI and is there a cost associated with that transportation? Uh, and then third, uh, are we operating under free market conditions or are there disruptions or uh, market factors, market factors, market disruptions that are affecting our ability to access these demand centers for our crude? Um, and I'm sure as most everyone here knows or is about to learn, uh, the answer to all of three of these questions is yes. There is a quality difference between WCS and WTI. There's a cost to transport our crude from Western Canada to the markets that demand our crude and consume our crude. And then there are on occasion um, factors and disruptions that either widen or narrow the differential depending on what's going on. So we'll get into quality, our first, our first variable in, in that differential equation. Um, there are two main components of crude quality. We have density, it's measured in API gravity, uh, and I'm sure most everyone here has heard the term extra heavy, heavy, medium, light. That's the range or the spectrum that 
um, describes density for our crudes. And then sulfur content, measured as a percentage, uh, sweet being less than half a percent sulfur, um, sour being greater than half a percent sulfur. And so how does Canadian crude fit into this? Um, <clears throat> it, it's important to note the majority of our crude that we produce in Western Canada and in Canada as a whole is heavy crude and is described by the Western Canadian Select Marker. Uh, the Western Canadian Select Marker is uh, a, it's a blend of crude, bitumen, and diluent, lands somewhere in the 20 degree API mark, uh, three to three and a half percent sulfur content, which, which, which falls, which lands us right in this heavy, sour crude um, uh, point in the spectrum. Now, if we compare that to WTI, we notice, okay, WTI is a 40 degree API crude, it's a sweet crude, it lands on the light end of the spectrum. So right away, coming back to that differential equation, we know that there has to be a quality adjustment uh, because physically a barrel of WCS is not the same as a barrel of WTI. They have to sell in the same physical location you'd expect them to sell at different prices because physically they're different things. So just to expand on, on why we talk about WCS so much, uh, this is a breakdown of uh, total Canadian production by crude quality. Um, 64, roughly 65% of crude production in 2018 came from the oil sands, uh, so that's heavy crude. Another 8% came from other heavy regions uh, in Western Canada. So over 70% from here across um, can be described by the WCS market, which is the biggest reason why we talk about it so much. It affects the vast majority of the production coming out of Western Canada. So how do we actually quantify this quality adjustment? Uh, the best way to do this is to look at a barrel of WCS and a barrel of WTI in the same physical location. Uh, and looking at the price of WCS and WTI in Houston in particular is, is useful because it's the same physical location, so it eliminates that transportation variable in our differential equation. Uh, and it's a market or it's an area of high demand for both WCS and WTI. About 50% of the U.S. refining capacity uh, is on the Gulf Coast, and uh, Houston's a major trading hub for, for both of these products. And when we compare these two prices um, in a relatively stable market, market environment, we notice that the differential is somewhere in the three to five dollar range. So a barrel of WTI will trade for three to five dollars more than a barrel of WCS. So that tells us, or it's a good indicator of, of that $15 we talked about on the first, one of the first slides, uh, three to five dollars of that is from the quality adjustment because of the difference between WCS and WTI. Moving on to transportation, uh, there are two main methods of transportation for our crudes in Western Canada. Number one, uh, pipelines, definitely the biggest or the, the, the largest means by which we transport our crude. And number two, uh, in recent years, uh, especially in recent years, the export capacity by crude by rail has, has become more and more important as our pipeline systems become full and producers move to uh, different options to, to access markets for their crude. Um, so I'll be looking into uh, the the costs associated with pipelines in the transportation adjustment, and then I'll touch on the costs associated with uh, crew by rail exports as well. So starting off with transportation, uh, we have three main pipeline systems in Western Canada. The first being the Enbridge system in, in yellow here. It carries our crude from Alberta to the U.S. Midwest. Uh, refine, it's a major, the U.S. Midwest is a major refining hub uh, we carry roughly, sorry, the Enbridge system carries roughly 2.7 million barrels a day worth of crude to the Midwest. So, so the vast majority of our crude exports leave Alberta via the Enbridge system. Uh, our second largest uh, system is the Keystone system running uh, 590,000 barrels a day from Alberta to the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, where there's, uh, like I said, a large amount of refining capacity, especially heavy crude refining capacity. Uh, 
And then a uh, smaller system, 300,000 barrels a day, moves crude from Alberta to the BC coast uh, via the um, Trans Mountain Pipeline. So if we look now at the historical WCS to WTI differential over the last nine years, this is uh, the beginning of 2010 all the way to the end of last year and actually the first month of this year. Um, what we see is a relative period of stability in this 2015 to 2017 time period. Um, and when we see this stability in the differentials, we, we can reasonably assume there were limited market factors and market disruptions happening over this time period. Um, and I'll get into a little bit uh, of this in particular, this time period in particular a little bit later. Um, but what, what this level of stability allows us to do is to estimate the transportation cost associated with these pipelines. Um, if we take this negative, or sorry, this $15 differential, roughly $15 differential, and we back out that uh, three to five dollar estimate we, we made for uh, the quality adjustment, we end up with uh, the transportation adjustment via pipelines being somewhere around that nine to twelve dollar range. Um, the, 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 contribu the contributor to the transportation adjustment via pipelines in our differential equation. Uh, but pipelines aren't the only way we move our crude anymore. Uh, it's important to talk about uh, transportation uh, via crude by rail and how it's increased significantly over the past few years, really ramped up uh, towards the end of 2012 uh, in response to these increased differentials here. Uh, and, and you can see how the differential responded uh, as a result of this increase. Uh, in any event, we estimate it, it, is, it is a more expensive means to transport our crude. Uh, we estimate it lands somewhere in the $15 to $25 barrel, rain, barrel uh, range. It really depends on the types of contracts that producers are signing with shippers. Uh, they'll, they'll definitely get more agreeable terms and a lower, a lower per barrel price the longer they agree to sign up for. So we, we, we kind of understand better now the quality adjustment and the transportation adjustment, um, the factors that go into that kind of baseline roughly $15 uh, US per barrel differential from WCS to WTI. Um, now we'll talk about the third factor in our differential equation, uh, market factors, or in particular market disruptions and how they affect these uh, price for, or these price differentials um, that we receive for our crude. Uh, the two main market factors that I'll be touching on uh, and the two biggest contributors uh, definitely in recent, in recent years are the demand for our crude or disruptions to that demand. Uh, and what impact do demand disruptions have on the price we receive for our crude? Uh, and then the second, the second point that I'll be going into is our access to these markets that generate this demand. If market access is restricted, how do, how do the differentials respond? Um, uh, how does the WCS differential respond to WTI? So the first thing we have to understand uh, when we look at demand and demand disruptions is how much of Western Canadian crude is exported and how much of uh, Canadian crude is consumed locally. How much do we depend on these external demand centers uh, to, um, how, how much does the price of our crude depend on these external demand centers? Uh, roughly 15% uh, of the crude we produce is consumed locally by local refiners in Western Canada. We have roughly 600,000 barrels a day of refining capacity in Western Canada. And the rest, 85%, is exported. And the vast majority, uh, if we think back to this pipe, our pipeline chart um, with the Enbridge system and the Keystone system, the vast majority of this 85% gets sent to the US. So 85%. Uh, where is all this crude going? The uh, U.S. is divided into five districts. They're called Petroleum Administration for Defense Districts, uh, often referred to as PADS uh, for short. Um, and the majority of our crude 
goes to pad two uh, in the Midwest via the Enbridge system and pad three via the Keystone system uh, to the Gulf Coast. And uh, this is just a breakdown of how much exactly we send to each pad uh, on a barrel per day basis and how it's grown uh, with growing Western Canadian production over the past nine years. Um, you notice this, this yellow orange chunk here. Uh, this piece is exports to pad two, uh, which makes sense. It's, it's where the Enbridge system terminates. Um, what isn't shown is not all of this crude is uh, refined in the U.S. Midwest. Some of this crude is rerouted to the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, it's just how the data is, is collected. It shows up as, as pad two. Uh, suffice it to say, the two major points, or the two major points of uh, destination for our crude is pad two and pad three. So now that we know that the majority of our crude gets sent to pad two, uh, and, and so we can deduce that we are obviously very dependent on demand from pad two. We can look at how demand disruptions in pad two have affected um, the WCS to WTI differential over the last couple of years. And what we notice, um, I guess first I'll, I'll explain what we're showing in this blue line here is refinery capacity utilization, um, basically refinery on time. Uh, from refiners in the Midwest, uh, and, and then uh, against the WTI, WTI to WCS differential in U.S. per barrel. Uh, and what we notice is a relative uptrend in uh, the WCS to WTI differential, or a decrease in the price that we receive for our crude in absolute terms, uh, during periods of uh, demand disruption on the refining side. When refinery capacity goes down, the differential goes up, there's more competition for our crude and producers are willing to take less for their crude to get it into these refineries. Um, and what we're seeing at the end of 2018 is a significant drop in refinery capacity utilization um, from these Midwest refiners. And as we would expect, the differentials responded accordingly. This material drop in refinery capacity uh, was one of the key factors that contributed to the record-wide differentials that we all saw at the end of 2018. So now I'll move on to the impact of market access disruptions and um, uh, the impact they have on the WCS to WTI differential. Uh, what we're showing here is the existing pipeline capacity uh, is the light gray, okay? And then overlaid on top of that is Western Canadian production and the WCS to WTI differential. And what we're gonna look at is the response to WCS um, to WTI differential uh, over periods of relative pinch points between this pipeline capacity chart uh, or this pipeline capacity line and the production line. Um, if we start in the 2013 2012-2013 uh, time period, we notice we were starting to see some pressures on our um, pipeline capacity uh, on production growth. And of course, as suspected, the differentials uh, grew. Um, so, so it's important to, to keep in mind that what we saw at the end of last year wasn't necessarily the first time we've seen it, um, to, to some extent anyways. Uh, and then we saw the differential start to decrease uh, towards the end of 2013, moving into 2014, as crude by rail exports picked up. Uh, that really took pressure off of the uh, pipelines and allowed the differential to stabilize somewhere in this kind of $20, $22 range, which is what we would expect um, or, or, or can be explained by the higher cost associated with crude by rail exports. Um, and then we moved to 2015. And what we saw here was a fairly uh, significant dip in Western Canadian production. Those were, uh, that, that dip is a result of the uh, producers in Western Canada shutting in production on low global oil prices. Uh, that was the time period just after 2014, prices really fell out as OPEC abandoned their swing producer role, 
flooded the market uh, in conjunction with the U.S. light tight oil. The crude prices came down and producers responded. And that helped take some pressure off of the pipeline system and normalize differentials here. Then we see this significant dip in the spring of 2016. Uh, these were the Fort Mac wildfires. Uh, they had such a material impact on production or cutting production over that time period that they helped normalize differentials over the remainder of 2016 and into 2017 because of that alleviated pressure on the pipeline systems. And then of course we move now into 2018 and what we notice is this white space between uh, the production uh, line and the pipeline capacity line. Um, this surplus, as expected, put a lot of pressure on pipeline systems um, and the differential responded. It, it increased significantly. And so it was this gap here in conjunction with this outage at the same time that really helped create these massive blowouts of the differential in November, October, November of 2018. And then moving into 2019, we have this drop in production here. These are the production curtailments. Um, we, we took 325,000 barrels a day off production uh, at the order of the, of the Alberta government, and uh, we saw differentials respond. They, they, they narrowed significantly, as suspected. So one last thing uh, uh, that's worth noting or worth looking at is this pipeline, or sorry, this uh, crude by rail export capacity chart uh, and how it's responded. This is, the, this is the crude by rail export capacity in blue, uh, and then again, the WCS to WTI differential. And we notice uh, how it responded in that 2012 to 2013 time period when the differentials had reached um, what was at that, t at that time record levels on that pinch point between uh, pipelines, or sorry, production and pipeline capacity. And then over the last few years, it's, it's remained somewhat of a, a baseline contributor to moving crude. Um, it's helped stabilize the differentials over the last year, uh, but of course, in late 2018 or over 2018 when we started to see production grow and grow out of Western Canada and breach that line of pipeline capacity uh, and differentials uh, responded, we saw crude by rail respond as well. It, it increased up to 350,000 barrels a day of export capacity in just a matter of months to try and capitalize on moving those extra barrels. Um, and then of course, uh, in the last month, as we would expect, We've uh, reduced uh, production by 325,000 barrels a day, um, and crude by rail has since responded. Uh, it's cut back now to somewhere around that 150 to 160,000 barrels a day range in the last month or so, uh, off of 350,000 barrels a day in December, January. Um, so just, just to kind of recap, uh, I know I've gone fast, but we have, we have a, lot, a lot of information to digest here, but um, I've touched on that differential equation that we have, WCS equals WTI minus quality adjustment minus transportation adjustment plus or minus um, the market factors. Uh, and now that we understand what goes into the differential and why they exist, uh, I'll touch on what we're kind of seeing on a more global basis. Uh, for oil and gas, or for oil, sorry, and then um, how Canada fits into, fits into that picture. So I'll start with some of the key themes that are driving or under, underpinning the global oil price um, right now, the first being the OPEC plus one production cuts um, in, an, in an attempt to balance what was an oversupplied market in late 2018 or second half of 2018, OPEC plus Russia agreed to another round of production cuts, this time for roughly 1.2 million barrels a day of, of supply curtailment. Um, and they're almost at full compliance now. They're roughly just shy of 1.2 million barrels a day uh, since January. And that's really helped alleviate crude prices in the last couple of months. The Brent price, uh, the global marker for crude is up roughly 30% since January 
first. Uh, so that's a material increase. Uh, the, the, the OPEC uh, plus Russia production cuts really helped bring market into balance in short order. Uh, the second point um, is U.S. light tight oil. We continue to see robust growth coming out of U.S. light tight oil, in particular the Permian. We've seen record growth uh, come out of there in the last couple of years. We continue to see um, robust growth for another year in 2019. Uh, but then moving beyond this year into next year and the year after, we're starting to see um, a few factors that we expect will limit growth coming out of these plays uh, in the next couple of years. We're starting to see uh, companies uh, lose or decrease their, their capital budgets as investors really emphasize or put pressure on producers for cash returns. Uh, we're starting to see per well productivity decrease um, as these producers move outside their sweet spots. Um, the amount of oil per well uh, they're getting is starting to kind of crest and, and decline. So we, we see a growth out of the US light tight oil plays as self-limiting over the next couple of years. And on that, we feel there's a need for investment now or soon into other plays outside of US light tight oil, like the oil sands, like offshore, in order to meet continued demand growth over the next three to five years. So on that investment or upstream capital investment, uh, what we're showing here is global oil and gas upstream capital investment since 2014. Uh, we're, we're here, this is, these are estimates of course for 2019. We're still slightly above the 2018 level, uh, but growth is slowing since that uh, bottom in 2016. And what we're saying is um, because, you know, if we, if we look at these investment levels in 2014 in particular, uh, roughly $800 billion US globally, um, a lot of production or almost all of production from the investment decisions and in projects uh, being invested in during this time period is now on production. So we're going to need to see investment levels grow outside of US light tight oil and return to levels close to this in the, in the next year or two in order to meet global demand going forward into plays, uh, like I said, like the oil sands, like offshore, um, plays outside, outside of the southern US and the Permian. So now moving into what we're seeing for Canadian crude production. Uh, this is a combination of CAPS forecast with some near-term adjustments that we've made at Spruill. Um, we're forecasting relatively flat production over the next few years. There's roughly 100,000 barrels a day of uh, current uh, projects under construction expected to come on stream in the next year or so. And these are oil sands projects. And then another 100,000 uh, that are expected to come on stream by 2023. But outside of that, uh, the growth is fairly limited uh, in, in Canada right now. The biggest challenge producers are having in raising capital for growth is investor confidence that there will be um, capacity to move this growth to markets. Uh, so until we start seeing a little bit more confidence around um, these pipeline projects in particular that are being approved and under constructed but haven't been completed yet, uh, we expect growth to be somewhat limited. And looking at these pipeline projects, again, uh, this is a graph showing the current pipeline capacity, roughly 4 million barrels a day leaving Western Canada, our production forecast in green, and then the three major pipeline projects in the hopper right now. We have the Enbridge Line 3 expansion, the Keystone XL pipeline, and then the Trans Mountain pipeline. Um, uh, just in the last couple of months, this Enbridge Line 3 project, which is slotted to add 370,000 barrels a day to export capacity in Western Canada, got pushed to sometime in late 2020, uh, late next year. Uh, then we have the Keystone project adding 830,000 barrels a day of capacity direct from Alberta to the Gulf Coast. Uh, and it won't be until Keystone comes on stream that we expect to see a surplus in pipeline capacity over production in Western Canada. 
Um, so that Keystone project will really be key to alleviating some of the pressure on our pipeline systems. Uh, and then, of course, Trans Mountain adding roughly 600,000 uh, barrels a day uh, of export capacity to the BC West Coast sometime in that 2023-2024 timeframe. And in the meantime, uh, we have this empty space again between production and pipeline capacity, and that's where we see crude by rail really playing a vital role in filling this gap and allowing for production to grow at least modestly over the next couple of years. And on that, if we look at crude by rail, um, exports have decreased in recent months with that uh, the pipeline curtailment or the, the production curtailment, sorry, uh, from levels where they were at the end of 2018 and the first month of 2019. We're, we're right around here, roughly 150, 160,000 barrels a day. Uh, we do see this uh, crude by rail capacity ramping up um, as we uh, feed this curtailed production back on stream, back into the, into the system. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we, we do have uh, roughly 100,000 barrels a day of oil sands projects that are expected to come on stream uh, in, in the next year or so. And, and we expect that incremental production to be moved uh, by crude by rail. We expect it to, to increase to roughly 350,000 barrels a day uh, by, by next year. And then uh, once Enbridge comes on, we expect, uh, again, the, the crude by rail export capacity will start to decline with that added 370,000 barrels a day of export capacity. But suffice it to say, we see uh, crude by rail continuing to be an important factor going forward uh, to move our growing production. Now, one important factor that I haven't touched on yet, um, but will have an impact or, or we expect will have an impact on uh, WCS to WTI differential starting next year is the International Maritime Organization's IMO 2020 Directive. Uh, and what they're saying is they're reducing the allowable sulfur content in maritime transportation fuels from 3.5% to 0.5%. Uh, and that's a, that's a fairly material drop um, in terms of sulfur content in, in these maritime fuels. And we expect to see, because of this drop, a drop in demand for high sulfur fuel oils, um, and in turn, a drop for global heavy sour crudes. Now, uh, there are some questions uh, surrounding compliance of this directive and enforcement of this directive globally. Um, so, so there are still questions uh, surrounding the effects and the impact of IMO 2020, uh, but nonetheless, we think, we estimate roughly a one to $3 U.S. per barrel uh, increase in the WCS to WTI differential because of IMO 2020 uh, causing globally a, a decrease in heavy sour crude demand. And now finally, our outlook for WCS to WTI. Um, one thing I, I haven't touched on yet, but I will briefly, is the uh, essentially the reversal of uh, what was going on in late 2018 when the differentials had diverged from fundamentals because of market forces. Um, they, they grew to exceptionally wide levels. Uh, now in the last couple of months, we've seen the reversal. We've seen them actually fall below what we would expect to be the fundamental level because of the combination of the decrease in supply from the, the, the production curtailments, the 325,000 barrel a day curtailment, uh, in combination with an increased demand for our heavy crude on the U.S. Gulf Coast because of sanctions on Venezuelan heavy crude. Refiners are scrambling to get more crude. There's a higher demand for us, lower supply, and it's narrowed that differential. Um, nonetheless, we think <clears throat> that in the next couple of months, as this production starts to come back on stream in Western Canada, this curtailed production, uh, differentials will start to increase, return to fundamental levels, and remain there for the next couple of years, somewhere in that $18 to $20 range, underpinned by the transportation economics of crude by rail and the quality adjustment um, uh, of WCS to WTI crude. 
And on that, um, I will pass it off to my colleague Chris to talk about the same thing on the gas side. Well, I think that was an insightful look into the uh, uh, Canadian crude market and the outlook. Over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to do the same on, on the gas side. I won't go into as much detail, but as you will see, the story on the gas side shares a lot of the, the same um, uh, traits as we've, we've just talked about on, on the crude side. So in terms of the base uh, benchmark we have in, in the Canadian gas market, uh, which is ACO, uh, the differential to Henry Hub has seen a widening, as you can see on this chart with the, you know, the gray bars uh, over the last few years. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, in this. But in terms of the framework that Liam established around how these differentials come about, it's very similar on, on the gas side with one major exception, and that is the fact that you've got uh, really the, the quality side of it captured in the heating value, which is part of pricing for natural gas, because we price it in you know, BTUs. Um, and so that's really taken care of already and built into the price. But we do have the transportation adjustment, which is really the price of getting the gas uh, from a Canadian place into end user markets, wherever that may be in the integrated North American market. And then we have a series of market factors that have been really driving that volatility uh, around the eco differential to the point where pricing has been negative at times. Uh, and we've seen some um, uh, real uh, challenges around the price where it's been really delinked from fundamentals. So talking a little bit about that, uh, you know, the heating value, um, and how that is already reflected in the price. This is still an important component in how producers of gas think about the economics for gas. Uh, and, and the key really is to uh, you know, think about, do I leave it in the gas stream and get paid for the heating value based on gas pricing, or do I process it and, and get paid separately for, for the NGLs? And as an example, You'll remember, you know, a few years ago, we had significant volatility around pricing for propane, for example, where propane pricing at times went negative. And, you know, in those cases, you would have been a lot better off just leaving it in uh, the gas stream. Uh, having said all that, you know, there are contractual obligations that sometimes dictate uh, what you can and cannot do. Uh, you may have take or pay obligations on, uh, on pipelines and, and processing. And the other thing is that pipelines themselves have specs around how rich or how wet or how many of the NGLs you can leave in the gas stream uh, to transport it. So we have one pipeline, which is the Alliance pipeline that's really been built uh, to get wet or rich gas to, uh, uh, to, the, to the Midwest. Uh, and that has been a, uh, a big driver for a lot of the production that we've seen out of place such as uh, the Montney, for example, which has a um, a, a high liquids content, depending on where you are in the, in the fairway. Now, all things remaining equal uh, in terms of transportation, uh, it, it's really a, you know, a function of uh, how much it costs to pipe your gas uh, from the uh, uh, Western Canadian uh, you know, key, key producer hubs to uh, end user markets. And, and as you can see, you know, this is kind of showing some of the uh, you know, the, the differentials and, and costs uh, around that. Um, it can differ quite a bit, uh, depending on where you send your gas. And so for a lot of, of uh, uh, Canadian producers, they've been focusing in these times where the eco market has been very challenged to diversify their exposure to different markets to maximize the, the economics that they can get for their production. And, and part of that uh, strategy has really been, been because of that, uh, uh, you know, the, the number of market factors that have caused some havoc around those differentials. And, and I'll touch on, on, on three of them. There are three main ones in our minds. Uh, and so one is the surge in gas production that we've seen in the U.S. to the point where U.S. production um, has now gone into a surplus position. The U.S. is now a net exporter of gas through LNG. They're also piping down to Mexico. Um, and in that market, you know, Canadian gas is really, uh, uh, you know, peripheral. And it's led to the, uh, you know, the notion of Canadian gas really being the marginal molecules uh, 
in that integrated North American market. The second aspect of it is the, uh, you know, the number of bottlenecks that have been um, developing in, in Western Canada, very similar to what we've seen on, on, the side, uh, on the oil side that Liam just talked about. And part of that is because you know, we, we have uh, had uh, new production hubs in areas like the Montney and Duvernay, so a new type of, of tight resource place. Uh, and that, that's where we've seen most of the growth, whereas most of the legacy infrastructure is, was really geared towards servicing other production hubs around more conventional gas production in Alberta. And so the infrastructure hasn't really kept up with that. Uh, and that's, again, very similar story to what we've seen on the, on the oil side. And the, the third aspect around market factors, and this is really more of an opportunity than a challenge, is the fact that we have now a North American market that's really taking the lead in the development of the global LNG market through the number of projects that have been constructed or are being built on the Gulf Coast um, in the US. And also in terms of how we think about contract terms and flexibility around that, the uh, US market has been uh, a driver and will continue to be a driver in the future. Now, Canada has not played yet in that market directly, but we do have LNG Canada that, that got, got to FID uh, late last year. And uh, you know, when that gets built, it will be the largest infrastructure investment um, through private capital in Canadian history. So that, that's a significant undertaking. And as we'll, we'll see, something that can really shift the fundamentals of the Canadian gas story as well. So how does really Canadian gas fit into the future for that evolving global market? And, and we like to revisit this slide, which really talks a little bit about the history of, of, uh, of the natural gas market in, in North America. Uh, and, it, and, it's, and it's key because it shows how quickly the market changed and the magnitude of that changed. And it also offers a great case study um, and, and as a warning for anyone trying to predict the future. So if you look at back in 2007, the US was the world's largest importer of natural gas. Right? We, we saw all these regasification terminals built uh, because the expectation was that that would continue to, uh, to, to grow in terms of the need to import gas from other uh, parts of the world. And that Canada, in fact, was not going to be able to produce enough gas uh, to be able to uh, address that shortfall that was expected to develop in the US. Now, um, with shale gas from places like the Barnett, uh, you know, the Haynesville, increasingly the Marcellus, starting to show the sheer amount of gas that could be produced commercially in the US, that market really turned. And, and it turned to the point where in 2017, the US became a net exporter of gas. And looking forward five to 10 years could be the world's largest exporter of natural gas through LNG as well. And of course, from a Canadian perspective, um, you know, that, that changes things for us because the US was, was really our one key customer and, uh, and we never saw that as, as something that would ever change. And if you look at how quickly that market changed, you could be somewhat forgiven that, although I guess uh, uh, you know, 10 years is a long time. Even 10 years though ago, you know, Canadian gas was not really uh, expected to be a major driver of the North American market for gas. Um, but I would say that um, the story back then was that we didn't have enough cheap and abundant gas in Canada to be able to fulfill that role. You fast forward to today, and I would argue that Canadian gas is among the most competitive gas resources in the world. And what holds us back is the fact that our one key customer, the US, no longer really needs that gas. And secondly, that we have yet to develop other export options, such as LNG, to be able to really monetize and fulfill that potential. And so in that world, unless we fulfill that potential, we're gonna be uh, peripheral in that integrated North American <coughs> gas market. And we're gonna continue to see, you know, rather wide differentials <coughs> 
relative to other more liquid hubs uh, and, and consumption centers, uh, whether that's Henry Hub or, or Dom. In fact, you know, if you, if you look at uh, Eastern Canada, and this is a, another good case in point, there are projections out there that would suggest that if, if Canada doesn't develop LNG exports over the next number of years, there could be a scenario over the next couple of decades where we actually become net importers of gas because what we are exporting out east today is going to be replaced by cheaper, more readily available gas in places like the Marcellus in the US. And just to demonstrate how much that uh, production story has, has changed in the US, you know, this is showing how uh, you know, even in, in 2018, it increased by 15% on, on the production side. So this story is, is, yes, it's about the U.S. becoming a net exporter of gas, but it's also a story of how that surplus is just growing um, increasingly every year. The shale revolution really started with, with gas. Um, and, you know, in the last few years, we've seen, you know, plays like the Marcellus and Utica in particular drive a lot of that growth. And this is dry gas as well. It doesn't really have much liquids uh, to support the economics. But the sheer scale of it um, helps support a, a, a story that uh, has underpinned uh, those changes in that market. The other thing to keep in mind is light tight oil plays like the Permian is also producing a lot of associated gas. So the Permian is now, uh, you know, they've crossed the 10 BCF per day uh, mark already. Uh, and that's essentially free gas. So again, in that kind of market, it's very hard for Canadian gas to compete. And, uh, uh, you know, that is really what has happened uh, from a, um, an eco pricing perspective, where in that setting, that uh, uh, has contributed to the widening differential of eco versus Henry Hub. Now, we talked a little bit about the bottlenecks around infrastructure. Again, familiar story to the crude side, and, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, if we go back in the last five years, you know, we were producing about 13.7 BCF per day of gas in Western Canada, if you look at just BC and Alberta. Um, that's up to, um, you know, just under 16 BCF today. And... Uh, that growth, about you know, 2 BCF or so, uh, is, is actually uh, all pretty much coming from, from two areas, and that's the Montney and the Deep Basin. Um, if you look at the history, you can see how that has changed over time. Um, and in fact, over that five-year period, I talked about how the overall uh, you know, gas production has increased by about 2 BCF. Mountain and deep basin alone represents about 4 BCF of growth. So the rest has actually declined over that period. And we've seen a lot of bottlenecks uh, develop as a result of that uh, because, again, this is, these are new production hubs in new areas that didn't have all that legacy infrastructure, particularly around you know, the northeast BC uh, where a lot of the mountain production is. There was also an expectation that a lot of the mountain and deep basin gas would eventually find its way to the West Coast for LNG projects, because we had a number of them planned for uh, you know, several years. Uh, we didn't get there in the end with most of them, but you know, that's, that's not to say that the story ends there. Um, and, and as a result of all that, we've seen underinvestment, relatively speaking, uh, around building out that pipeline capacity, uh, and particularly around upstream of James River, We've also had a lot of maintenance and outages in the last couple of years, uh, especially in the summers, where it's been virtually impossible for Canadian producers to get their gas to market uh, unless they have you know, firm capacity on the pipeline network. Um, now, TransCanada has an active investment program in place to be able to deal with, with some of these uh, uh, bottlenecks. Uh, they're going to spend about $7 billion over the next uh, two to three years to, to provide some relief to that, which will be important. Doesn't necessarily add more capacity uh, in terms of the volume of gas, um, but it will help with some other things as well uh, around, uh, of course, the, bot the bottlenecking around upstream of James River, but also with respect to getting more gas to uh, uh, Empress through the East Gate, 
uh, and getting some more uh, production on the mainline system that uh, transports gas to uh, eastern Canada. And that is still uh, uh, important if Western Canadian gas is going to be able to compete in eastern Canada. Uh, the Dawn market was historically uh, you know, a, a market that had no competition. Um, it was all served by Western Canadian gas that was fairly expensive. Tolls were pretty high. Um, you know, we were paying $2 per MCF uh, traditionally with, uh, you know, most of that essentially getting passed on to Ontario consumers. Now that changed once we got some real production coming out of the Marcellus. And last year we had the Rover and Nexus pipelines as well, which now have almost 5 BCF per day of, of new uh, production coming into the uh, Midwest and Ontario market. Now that creates some real competition at dawn. Um, and with some spare mainline capacity is part of the reason why TransCanada worked with the, uh, many of the producers in Western Canada to sign up on, on a long-term um, firm capacity on the mainline uh, for 10 years, but at a much lower toll at 77 cents, which allows uh, Montney or, or other uh, lower supply gas to be pretty competitive actually at, at dawn relative to the Marcellus. And the other thing, I guess, is, is Dawn is now emerging as a result of this as a key hub where we can see how this gas-on-gas -gas competition will play out in, uh, in the Canadian market. So the only other thing that can really fundamentally alter the outlook for Canadian gas, I kind of alluded to this already, is LNG. And in the last couple of years in particular, we've seen a real surge in, in LNG demand, particularly from Asia. Uh, that is expected to continue um, to the point where we're seeing that supply demand gap starting to widen um, and, and start to really open up in, uh, in the mid-2020s. And that means that we have a rather short investment window right now, given the long lead time to get an LNG project built uh, to be able to address that gap. And Canada really has... Uh, great potential to be a, a major player in the LNG space. Um, and we ought to be an LNG exporter. You know, in terms of the competitiveness here um, of the resource that we have, uh, we have about, you know, half the shipping time to get to Asia relative to the Gulf Coast, even when you go through the Panama Canal, which is expensive. Um, that drives better economics on the shipping side. There's less boil off. We also have a cooler climate, which helps when you're dealing with, you know, liquefaction, minus 162 degrees Celsius. Um, we have got cheap uh, eco gas as well as, uh, you know, to, to drive the liquefaction process or hydro. And again, from an operating cost perspective, LNG Canada is, is set to be a very competitive alternative. Uh, capital costs are a little bit higher uh, in Canada relative to the U.S. Gulf Coast. But that's because primarily uh, the U.S. Gulf Coast projects were, uh, you know, often conversions like Sabine Pass from regas terminals, where you already have a lot of the infrastructure built and you're already connected to, to the pipeline network. Uh, but if you compare the capital costs of getting a project built, say, in Kitimat, relative to many other parts of the world, I'd say that Canadian uh, uh, projects still stack up pretty well. And then, you know, you consider the fact that a lot of the LNG in the Canadian market is going to be underpinned by a resource like the Montney, where you have a lot of liquids, which favors greater economics. And then you also look at the potential for expansion. So, you know, LNG Canada is, is really uh, setting off initially with a couple of trains. Uh, and we've got two BCF per day of gas going through coastal gas links to get it to the coast. Once you look at trains three and four, where really all the money is made, and, and you look at the potential to expand that pipeline capacity by adding another billion dollars of compression and doubling that capacity, we can now look at potentially you know, 5 BCF per day just through that one project to get 5 BCF per day of gas to the, to the West Coast in a market that today is around 16 BCF. It's going to be very significant. And let's not forget about the big picture. You know, Canada is a, a major player in the natural gas space globally. We're the fifth largest producer. 
outside of the, uh, the US, we're really the only uh, jurisdiction that has a major resource place that could be developed for LNG, maybe with the exception of Argentina through the Vaca Muerta longer term. Um, we have a lot of the know-how, the expertise, and best practices, uh, and a green profile around how we develop mega projects that, that resonates. Plus, we've got you know, the, the portfolio um, attraction as well, as you know, we, we enter an era where uh, trade relationships have been somewhat fragile, and where uh, Canada can offer uh, you know, another option for uh, particularly Asian players looking to diversify uh, their exposure to different markets. So in an increasingly global market for gas, you know, Canada is uh, going to play you know, either directly uh, through our own projects on the LNG side, through one or, or more, or indirectly through the US uh, in that integrated North American market. So even though we're gonna be that marginal molecule in, in the North American market, uh, we have tremendous potential and uh, monetizing and fulfilling that potential means we need to get LNG going. Now in our forecast, we do see a gradual return to, to fundamentals. This is really more driven by the, uh, uh, you know, the expectation that we'll have a lot of the bottlenecking over coming years. And um, you know, we, we see that kind of settle at around a dollar uh, US between ACO and Henry Hub, and that's also reflective that we're seeing a lot more investment um, into uh, the NGTL system, for example, that will drive costs up over time, um, but where we'll see the bottlenecking and, and a return to fundamentals. The other aspect of this is that the Henry Hub, over time, um, should also get a lift from that greater integration and as a driver of that uh, evolution of the global market for LNG. So to summarize, yes, Canadian gas has lost market share in the US and we're getting crowded out. We're becoming the marginal molecule as US, as our only customer, has uh, become a net exporter themselves. But we do have the resource, we've got the location, we've got the expertise to be, if not you know, the leading player, at least a, a major player in the global market for LNG. Um, in the short to medium term, we see continued volatility around pricing, but help is coming, and that the bottlenecking will, will certainly help stabilize that price over time. Longer, time, you know, longer term, if we're looking out, as I said, uh, five years out, if we can get LNG Canada or other LNG export capacity uh, up, and, up and going, uh, we have a real chance uh, to play into that global uh, supply demand wedge that's, that's opening up and fulfill our potential, uh, our potential as a, uh, a superpower within the natural gas market. So uh, with that, uh, I, uh, I think we can open it up for, for some questions. So, so I've got a question on the gas pricing and how you think NGTL and ACO might evolve with the uh, evolution of LNG. Do you see a split in the tolling model from the Montney and the rest of the producers? Well, it all, it all depends on the pipelines, really, uh, and, and what that ultimate tolling model looks like. I think uh, if you had you know, the, the broader vision around an integrated system, uh, and I'm not saying this is where we, we end up, but you could foresee uh, you know, an option where you had a major pipeline, whether that's coast, Coastal Gas Link or not, rolled into a larger NGTL system, uh, which would help create you know, a, a lower cost base for everybody um, and probably be a better reflection of where some of that gas is going longer term. Now in the short term, that's not how we are conceiving of uh, you know, Coastal Gas Link and LNG Canada as a project because it's fairly standalone. However, there are some outstanding regulatory hurdles around this very issue. So uh, I, I think there is, in, in whatever that outcome might be, I think there will be opportunities to rethink how NGTL uh, stalling model is going to evolve. And I think LNG is going to be a, a net positive to how that develops. Uh, why do, are there so many uh, refineries in the US that are geared towards taking heavy oil 
that they need to import from countries like Venezuela, Mexico, and Canada? Well, it's, it, it's really more of a legacy issue more than anything. You know, we haven't seen a lot of new refineries built in, uh, in North America over the last number of decades. And, and so it, it was really reflective of, of the mix, um, you know, historically with, uh, you know, the U.S. relying on a lot of heavier crudes from places like, uh, you know, me both Mexico and Venezuela, uh, to some extent Canada. And so they've al al always been set up as uh, fairly complex refineries uh, in a setting where the U.S. was expected to continue to be a net importer of crude for the foreseeable future. Uh, and so I, I just think it's a legacy issue that does not reflect the production mix today, but one that would be far too costly to really do anything about at this point. On the gas side, you didn't mention, you said that without the Canadian LNG exports, the industry is in a dire situation. What about the domestic demand opportunities, uh, specifically within the power generation and petrochemicals? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It, it, it's, it's a good question. It does touch on something that uh, is going to be one driver. There's no question that the fundamentals for demand growth domestically, especially in Alberta, remains uh, reasonably strong. But, you know, we're talking about one to two BCF over quite some, quite a long period, actually, over the next 10 years. So it's not really going to move the needle and, and wouldn't really allow us to truly realize that potential um, of a resource that's really world-class, both in terms of supply cost uh, and just overall economics.